everyone. My name is Dan Short, and uh, I'm pleased to bring to you a set of uh, unique videos uh, describing the Ericksonian approach. And I will first tell you a little bit about myself and uh, what has led me to this project. I have worked for nearly 30 years as an Ericksonian practitioner and a scholar uh, with as many as uh, 1,500 hours of researching and studying audio from Erickson when he was teaching, doing therapy, uh, while I was working in the Erickson archives. I have worked in the past as the uh, assistant director at the foundation, newsletter editor, and now I serve as a director for the Milton H. Erickson Institute of Phoenix. And uh, what has, uh, a couple years back, uh, Jeff Zeig uh, tried, brought together some people to try to make a push to expand the uh, understanding of Ericksonian therapy and to get it uh, studied uh, more carefully in research. And in order to uh, uh, do that effort, we brought in some experts, uh, one of those being uh, Scott Miller, who has been a, a long time uh, associated with the Erickson Foundation and helping teach his own version of, of therapy that uh, operates along some of the same dynamics and same principles as Ericksonian therapy. And so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Scott Miller and uh, let you just tell a little bit about yourself. Dan, thanks for pulling all of this information together and all of those who had close contact with Dr. Erickson and learned directly from him. I'm the director of the International Center for Clinical Excellence, and as you say, I have been involved with the Erickson Foundation dating back to the 1980s when I met a psychologist that happened to live in the area where I was going to graduate school. His name was Lynn Johnson. He had studied directly with Dr. Erickson, had visited him several times, and was quite interested in the impact of potential Ericksonian strategies on psychotherapy outcome. After I left graduate school, I went to work in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That was a, a more than a stone's throw from where I grew up in Southern California. It was a completely different culture and place, but it was very familiar to me because, as you know, Steve DeShazer was highly influenced by John Weakland, whose team at the MRI and the Bateson Group had been highly influenced by Dr. Erickson. So I feel like I've been swimming in this Ericksonian sea for some time, trying to understand how to best apply the ideas, and more importantly, with regard to your particular project, specifying what went into Ericksonian therapy. When somebody said, I do Ericksonian work, trying to figure out exactly what did that mean? Did that mean you did interspersal when you did hypnosis? Did it mean you did in, uh, some form of rituals with your clients? His work was so rich and so diverse that understanding the core elements, the core principles, as you called them earlier, was, I think, a gargantuan task. So once again, bravo to you for working to pull this together, and I'm glad to have played a very small role in that process. Well, I, uh, you're being modest. Uh, uh, you were fin uh, foundational to helping us figure out what we needed to do to move forward. I, uh, so that people understand uh, these ideas that were about to be presented in these different videos, they're, uh, it's not based on one person's theory or idea or observation. We have had a lot of that, of people watching Erickson, uh, uh, looking at cases, and then constructing a theory around it, uh, yeah. in their version. Uh, what I did was contacted as many as I could of the world's leading authorities on Ericksonian therapy. And so I think we ended up with somewhere around 50 individuals that responded to what was essentially a qualitative analysis where people are describing their best understanding of what is the essence of Ericksonian psychotherapy or hypnosis. In other words, if this piece is missing, you don't really have Ericksonian therapy. Right. From that analysis, a little more qualitative study, there was some videos compared, some people Ericksonian, some people not, and rating scales that were developed. And as it came out, at least in this one trial that I conducted, you could, with this rating scale that helped people measure these core competencies, reliably distinguish if someone was Ericksonian or not from students who hadn't studied Erickson and didn't know one thing from the other. Yeah. So 
uh, there's at least some early evidence to support that you know these things matter and that if you want to know the difference between Ericksonian therapy and another one that may be fairly close to it, such as uh, person-centered therapy or traditional hypnosis. Or solution-focused therapy. Solution-focused therapy, very, very close. Uh, it, these, these core concepts seem to identify. So it's kind of like finding having an address for your house. We've got this home that all these people live with in and around the world, and they do seem to be doing something pretty consistent. People do yeah. be, seem to have been learning a body of knowledge that allows them to work in, a, in, a, in a, a very similar way, even though they're all using different techniques and right. their own personality into it, which makes this very fascinating. When I first, uh, you had mentioned to me, Scott, I was like, what do we do to get the ball rolling on the research? What do you do? And you said, you've got to have a treatment manual because you, you've got to be able to identify what you're measuring and say that that's what's happening and not something else. Yes. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll create a treatment manual. And the backlash that I received when I notified people of what I was doing, uh, one or two good Ericksonians actually refused to communicate with me after that. Amazing. <laughs> and uh, I, what, what I said is, no, 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 this isn't an attempt to destroy Ericksonian therapy and turn it into a step-by-step -step protocol. Or not. It's just an attempt to identify what is happening reliably and consistently. Yeah. So we can measure it. And then when I finished the treatment manual and released it to all the different directors and institutes around the world, 100% responded back, you've done it. You, you've identified it. There's plenty of room for individuality. You haven't turned it into a doctrine. Right. What, what, you've, what you've done in essence, Dan, I, I think it is, is critical. Whenever we're looking at the work of a super innovative thinker who has students and who's also charismatic, each of the students hears slightly different messages. That's good things. That means the ideas will continue to evolve. But when we get to the research phase and we ask, well, are they doing it? Are, are, they, are they emulating? Would Erickson agree with this? Would, would he say that it was a way of doing the kind of therapy that he thought reflected his thinking, his work, his innovations? That is a big step. And then being able to show discriminant validity that these categories help you distinguish between something like Ericksonian work versus solution focus, which as you say, is a cousin or a descendant, at least, we should say, to Erickson's work. And it's a significant effort to really distinguish those elements because, as you say, people get invested in their particular interpretation. They take it in a, in a particular direction. What you've done is looked at the DNA. And critically, when you identify the DNA, even though you and I share 99.99999% of our genes, we look different, we come from different parts of the world, we have different thoughts, that's a good thing because you can operationalize that DNA in ways that help you survive where you're at, help you help your family where you're at. That is what the core competencies are all about. What's the DNA? Then it's the individual practitioner's job to make that come alive based on who they are, where they live, who they're working with. I really like that analogy or the metaphor of the DNA that makes a lot of sense. I was recently, uh, the other day, doing a conference where I was uh, privileged to have uh, Roxana Erickson come on and watch some of it. And uh, I said, I think you'll find what you'll find fascinating is I'm going to give a very detailed analysis of one of Erickson's case with a woman who comes in with XYZ symptoms, has XYZ problems, and he goes at getting uh, inf understanding of what's happening with her at subconscious levels. Then I'm going to contrast that with a case I'm doing woman, XYZ symptoms, same age, same behavior literally in the office, and you'll see my process of going through and getting at subconscious knowledge and arriving at a completely different place. And the therapy's done, the, the, the techniques are not the same, yet if you understand the DNA, when you look at it, you realize these are both Ericksonian therapy. Right, right. And that's my sort of my understanding, and, and, and the, you can see it and recognize it if you know the core competencies. So that's right. And what I think is critical is having that document that says here they are, because you and I can point our fingers at say a gorilla and say, well, that's not human. 
But the question is, well, how do we know that? And could we reliably distinguish between those in a different way, in a more scientific way, so that we can study them further, their distinguishing qualities? Because again, while we share a lot of our genetic material in common with gorillas, we're clearly not. And the difference is essential here. And yep. while Solution Focus shares a fair bit of its DNA with Ericksonian work, it's, it's not Ericksonian. And being able to say that is critical if I want to do research and establish whether or not Erickson's innovations and insights and way of working makes a difference in the lives of the people. And in particular, it also allows us then to say, why don't we compare Ericksonian work with Solution Focus and see is one more effective than the other in general? Or is it more effective with certain kinds of issues and concerns than others? So I, I think it's a significant step in the direction of being able to provide more detailed and valid research assessment of the ideas that Dr. Erickson developed uh, so, so many years ago. And then I was wondering if you could speak to us just a little bit on the concept of deliberate practice too, because here we have, I've done in groups where we have someone do a little bit of therapy, maybe in a role play or maybe show a video of their work. And then we can sit down with these uh, scales and look at the core competencies and you'll get either kind of high or low on some of these uh, competencies. And then it's really interesting to go to the ones that are lower and then ask the person to speculate on what they might could have done to, to and then have the room speculate that. And it's amazing the dialogue that ensues. I don't know if you would consider that deliberate practice or not. In, 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 so there's, there are sort of two levels in terms of deliberate practice. And deliberate practice is, as the name implies, conscious and intentional repetition with the aim of successive refinement. That, that's what deliberate practice is. And in 2007, we were looking for a way to understand why certain clinicians were more effective than others. And Daryl Chow did the first study, found that people who spent more time in deliberate practice were significantly more effective than their peers. Now, that's important to point out that all of us practice, but those who were better simply do it more and they're much more intentional about it. They're focused on their learning edge. What skills do they need to acquire in order to improve their effectiveness? Whenever I talk about this, most people nod their head and say, it makes perfect sense to me. Most of us, our parents told us, if you want to get better at the piano, the guitar, in school, you have to practice. So that's not an alien idea, actually. But what's new is that it has to be at your performance edge. And when I talk about this, then people say, well, just tell me what to practice and I'll do it. That means you have to be able to assess how well you have incorporated the particular skills which return us right back to the core competencies. Yep. We, need, we need to know where are you in terms of your skills with regard to, in this case, Ericksonian uh, treatment. Yeah. And the, the core competencies can help you do that. And critically, it can help you do that without robbing you of your individuality. So I don't know if you were trained in the same way, Dan, and maybe it's just me because I've always been and I continue to be an anxious therapist, meaning I want to do right by the people I work with. I am in the room. I may appear confident, but as I'm going in and as I'm leaving, what I'm always thinking is I could have done better. I should have done better. I wish I would have prepared more. I could. That's just the way my, my mind uh, works. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It makes sure that we are in, at our learning edge. The mindset you're describing is going to cause a person to be much more careful and much more methodical and willing to question their practice. What they do. Exactly. And that, that's key. So we're going we're gonna to we're gonna have to be critical and evaluating what we're doing. The core competence, what we don't want, and I think this is where I was going, was for people to all act the same. This is what's problematic about scripting. So in my days in Solution Focus back in the 90s, the early 90s, we had this intervention called the miracle question. You know, I think it's a direct descendant of Erickson's work with the crystal ball technique. It, it, you, you haven't people imagine their lives different in, in these crystal balls. Okay, so it's the miracle question now. And what we did and what we wrote about was exact verbal utterances, almost like we were trying to cast a spell. 
yeah. by people. A book dysphagia put out, words are originally magic. There you go. And you, you had to say the words in the right order and exactly the right thing. And you see this in the protocols. If you don't move your fingers back at exactly these intervals, then it doesn't work. It all goes to hell in a handbasket. None <laughs> of that is true. And it turns us all into drones. It's like this old Twilight episode. I don't know if you remember this episode. The Twilight Zone episode where this person who looks different from everybody else in the program is going to have surgery to fix her. And it, they can choose between two different ways of looking and everybody looks the exact same way. We don't want that in therapy. We want people to operationalize solid clinical principles in their own way, from their own background and culture, and attending to the individual clients that they work with. So that means that you as the trainer in Ericksonian therapy can assess according to these principles without robbing people, as I say, of their individuality. You want them to embody it in a way that's congruent for them and that fits the place where they work and the people that they're working with. So that's what we can deliberately practice. We can deliberately practice. How close am I to embodying these principles in, in, my, in my work? And then you can point out, how they might have altered things in a, in a slight way, given your experience, to improve their embodiment of that particular principle. Well, very well put. I uh, am uh, appreciative of, of your uh, help with this project as we move forward, of you sure. explaining the importance of identifying these core competencies. And it's with great pleasure that I uh, introduce to everyone uh, these following six videos where you get to see the DNA of Ericksonian therapy.